Hi everyone, this is Jake, aka Lunar Wolf. Welcome to another guide in my Zero to Hero New Player Guide series. With the season at its close, we'll be entering the postseason, which allows you to stock up on silver and artillery. The information in this video should give you a good idea of what artillery to stock up on for the next season in order to get a jump on your opponents. Artillery comes in many different shapes with increasing rarities. Some are craftable, and others are obtained purely through RNG or special means. The first part will focus on craftable artillery. I covered artillery crafting in a previous video, so go check that out as I won't be going into detail. The craftable artillery are culverins, cannons, scorpions, hawatches, grape shots, ballistas, and mortars. Luckily for you, a good portion of these craftable items are a large part of the endgame meta for sieges, ranked, and territory wars. If you are relatively new to the game, you might be wondering why you'd want to have a few of each of these types of artillery, and what they're good for, as well as which ones to avoid wasting your materials on. Let's start with the culverin. Historically, a culverin was a shared name between early handheld muskets and late medieval cannons. For the sake of this game, we'll attribute the culverin to the lighter construction long-barreled cannon. Conqueror's Blade, a culverin is a small cannon designed around range and precision. While it won't hit as hard as some of the artillery, its great range and precision make it a must-have for taking out enemy artillery and siege equipment. The differences in rarity from green to blue to purple don't yield quite a large difference in the way of increased damage, but provide more ammo per artillery placement while also increasing the health of the artillery and some minor damage increase. Plan to take these into sieges, territory wars, and ranked solely for the purpose of destroying artillery and not to remove units or kill heroes. Cannons in this game fit more accurately with the namesake throughout history. Large constructions with relatively large caliber and potentially explosive ammunition. Cannons are fairly versatile in their ability to destroy enemy siege equipment as well as provide ample splash damage to remove enemy units and heroes alike. While more powerful than a culverin in terms of raw damage numbers, the cannon will have lower accuracy over the longer ranges. In recent patches, the cannon damage was nerfed considerably and deals less damage than it did in the past, but it still packs a punch now. In terms of placement and usage, cannons are fairly idiot-proof and usable in most situations, making it a staple in all types of endgame play. Increasing in rarity from green to purple will yield higher ammo reserves, larger AoE, and higher damage output. Scorpios, historically, are Roman torsion-based siege engines. In Conqueror's Blade, the Scorpio would lob small firebombs over medium distances that explode on impact, causing minor splash damage while setting units and heroes ablaze. Due to an increase in fire-resistant units in the meta, and the inherent low damage of these actual bursts and bombs. Scorpios are not all that useful unless you're working against incredibly light armor units. Due to an increase in fire resistant units in the meta and the inherent low damage of the bombs themselves, Scorpios are nowhere near as useful unless you're working against incredibly light armored units, just wanna pepper the enemy and annoy them with fire damage. I'd recommend saving your silver and materials for a better and more usable artillery. Good thing there's no legendary version of this artillery, as the development of such a weapon would have been a legendary waste of time. A Hwacha in Conqueror's Blade is modeled after the Korean-designed Hwacha that fired 100 to 200 flaming arrows with packets of gunpowder in the tips. Until recently, the Hwacha was a fairly mediocre weapon for typical gameplay, as the arrows didn't deal enough damage to warrant the usage over other types of artillery. Now we find the Hwacha as a useful staple in endgame play due to the quick maneuverability of the short range fire pattern and the increased damage of the individual arrows, making it great for defensive choke points to take out enemy units and heroes. As you increase the rarity of the Hawacha, you improve the damage output, fire duration, and reserve ammo. A grape shot is a collection of small caliber round shots packed in a tight geometric arrangement inside a canvas bag, separated from the gunpowder that propels it. In Conqueror's Blade, we find this artillery using a very short-ranged, short-barreled cannon with a wide spread of resulting high damage. Grape shots are not ideal artillery to have in every endgame situation, but they are quite fun to set up around corners and 
just straight up delete enemy heroes, units, and horses in a single blast. These are incredibly effective in tight choke points where you can hide around corners, but entirely useless in any situation involving medium to long range. With the increase in rarity, the Grape Shot gains higher damage and more reserve ammo, as well as a tighter spread on the shots. Much like the Culverin and Cannon, historically, a Ballista had various designs and multiple projectile types depending on the era of usage. Most commonly, Ballistas were torsion-based weapons that fired bolts, which is the basis for the Conqueror's Blade design. In Conqueror's Blade, Ballistas are long-range precision siege weapons with no splash damage. The sole purpose of the Ballista is to kill enemy heroes. Since this weapon type is extremely unforgiving if you barely miss your shot, it's not ideal in in-game scenarios. But getting that headshot with a purple Ballista is one of the most satisfying things in this game. The biggest differences between the three rarities, green, blue, and purple, is projectile damage, and reserve ammo, with purple or optimal being the best. We now come to the last of the craftable artillery, the mortar. While most historical mortars were relatively small field artillery, the Conqueror's Blade Mortar is designed most closely to mimic the Monster Mortar, created in 1832, which had a 24 inch, or for our overseas friends, the 610 millimeter caliber projectile. These were large mortars created during World War II, but none ever saw combat. Historically, mortar shells were explosive and had a fuse timed for impact to inflict heavy damage. In Conqueror's Blade, they take the same approach. Mortars are designed to hit the hard-to-hit areas. With huge arcing trajectories and long range, you can quickly devastate enemy unit formations and enemy siege equipment, typically hidden from regular line-of-sight artillery. On top of the high impact and splash damage, mortars inflict a minor burn damage and knock down units and heroes. Mortars only come in two rarities, blue and purple. While the purple mortars have more ammo and more damage output, blue mortars are more effective for close range combat due to the drastically shorter projectile arc, making each rarity incredibly useful in certain scenarios. The next topic covers non-craftable artillery. All uncraftable artillery will either be of the optimal or legendary rarity and include the following artillery types. Flaming Comet, War Rockets, Catapult, Siege Ballista, and the Great Bombard. Aside from the Bombard and the War Rockets, the main focus of the uncraftable artillery is more so to take out other siege equipment quickly due to the high amount of explosion or blunt damage. The Flaming Comet is essentially a Hoacha on steroids. While the Hoacha is great for taking out units and heroes, the Flaming Comet is more designed around the removal of siege towers. It's still quite effective at unit deletion, but you should focus the usage solely on siege towers, as the high explosive damage and the splash radius allow you to quickly take out not only the units pushing the siege towers, but the tower itself. This artillery type is very situational, and should be used accordingly. War rockets are a more general purpose type of longer range AOE artillery based off of the rocket artillery found in medieval Europe and China. With shorter range than purple mortars, but a longer firing cycle, war rockets, while not high on the artillery DPS scale, are great for applying pressure to key areas as the sustained AOE impact will cause enemy players to move their units from those points or risk them being lost. The difference in rarity between purple and legendary, or orange, will increase the damage and the health. Much like its younger cousin, the Scorpio, the Catapult is modeled after the historical ballistic siege engine used for firing large stones over long distances. While historically one of the most effective siege engines, it fails to meet that standard in Conqueror's Blade. The only real use of this artillery is to take out siege towers, making this a one-trick pony and keeping it lower on the priority list of artillery compared to the more multi-purposed equipment like mortars. The Siege Ballista shares a similar relationship to the Ballista that we see between the Flaming Comet and the Hoacha, focusing on the destruction of siege equipment. While arguably more satisfying to kill a hero with a Siege Ballista than its younger brother, your main goal should be targeting siege towers, trebuchets, and other artillery on the battlefield to clear them out as quickly as possible. Siege ballistas, again, are no explosive, 
no splash damage, but pure high damage single target hits. We finally reach the rarest of all artillery, the Great Bombard. I believe only three have ever been obtainable since the introduction in Season 4. This massive cannon and mortar combo can do it all, with incredibly low reserve ammo and no regard for friend or foe in its path of destruction, this is a last resort type of artillery. Anything in front of this beast when fired will immediately die, so use it with great caution. There are some items that are considered siege equipment, but not necessarily of the craftable nature or typical plantable nature that you would find generally in sieges or territory wars. These special siege weapons and siege equipment need to be obtained specifically from a field camp in order to utilize them in a territory war. These include siege towers, trebuchets, and battering rams. Siege towers are specially attained siege equipment from field camps, your house places in the open world. This equipment requires a specific house level of martial and a certain amount of prestige to obtain. Towers are built in special locations on city maps in Territory Wars and used much like the siege towers in normal siege matches. For high priority targets, these towers are incredibly useful and can be a game changer when sieging an opposing enemy's fief. Much like siege towers, trebuchets can also be obtained from these field camps with the same requirements, house level martial and a certain amount of prestige to obtain. They are placed in special locations as well on these Territory War maps and act just like your trebuchet on any siege map. Each ally has one treb shot per their time in the battle. If they exit or die in return, they do get another shot if the treb is still alive. Much like the other special siege equipment, battering rams also require you to be a marshal and have a certain amount of prestige to purchase them from your field camps. While not entirely effective in endgame scenarios like Territory Wars, a battering ram may be able to pull some pressure off of other siege equipment if it is strategically placed. I wouldn't recommend using a battering ram in Territory Wars, as that prestige can be utilized much more effectively with the use of siege towers or trebuchets. So as you can see here in the spreadsheet that I've made, there's a ton of differences between each different type of artillery that we've gone over here. I'll post this spreadsheet in the description of the video for those that want to actually see it. But let's just kind of take a, a second to look at these objective numbers and figure out what the main differences are between their artillery types and why people go for the ones that they go for. So if you look here with, with mortars, the two main types, well, the two only types are purple and blue, well-made and optimal. Now there's quite a decent difference in the explosion damage and the splash damage but relatively not much more of a change outside of, of that, aside from the shorter min and max range for the arcing shot, or the longer range for the optimal mortar. Now, I don't really have range numbers or effective range numbers, as it, it is a bit difficult to kind of estimate that in game here, because there isn't really a, a range calculator. But if you've played around with a well-made mortar versus an optimal mortar, you'll notice that as enemies got a lot closer to you with the well-made mortar, you can blast them at a much greater distance to help kind of ward them from your artillery and the other artillery here. Now, another great thing about the mortar and why it is incredibly useful in these scenarios, you can tell that the damage really isn't as high per shot as it is on some other types of artillery here but it has a non-line-of-sight type of trajectory. You can hit effectively around corners and walls at shorter or greater distances to apply proper pressure that you can't apply with a cannon or a culverin or a hawacha because you can't shoot around corners with them. Jumping over to the cannon, you can see that it has some pretty high damage numbers and effectively will deal more damage to units and enemy heroes than something like the mortar but you have to have a line of sight on the enemy in order to properly hit it. You might be able to skirt around the corner and get some splash damage, but the splash damage range is quite a bit less than what you would find when it comes to a mortar hitting the area there. You still get that same kind of knockdown and that stagger, but you're pretty much just limited to direct line of sight shots. 
These are great for taking out siege equipment and other types of artillery, as well as popping a few heroes or shield walls that are trying to hold a point. Pawachas have come, again, a long way. We discussed this earlier in the video of how they kind of just weaseled their way back into the meta, but you can see some pretty interesting things about the Hoachas themselves. So if you've noticed here, the blue Hoacha actually deals more damage per arrow than the optimal Hoacha does, but it has a reduced armor penetration and reduced amount of ammo, and of course reduced HP compared to its purple counterpart. And if you do some quick math here, if you happen to land every single shot with a blue Hoacha, 4,800 damage per shot, multiplied by 32 arrows, you're doing about 153 to 154,000 damage. Whereas with the optimal Hawacha, you might think with the 48 arrows per volley, you get more damage out of it, but you actually get effectively less damage out of a single volley than what you would find with the well-made Hawacha. But your armor penetration is higher. And the reason why you would wanna go for a purple Hawacha over a blue Hawacha is that you have a much, much higher accuracy with where your shots are being placed. If you've noticed through all artillery on siege matches or territory wars, whenever you put them down, there's a vast amount of play in where that shot actually lands. So typically the higher quality items will have a tighter tolerancing on the actual spread of the, that fire and where that target actually is. So keep that in mind. But both of them are actually very effective at say, you know, the front door when units are rushing in, you can just burn them all. Now, culverins, those are fun. You can see some high single target damage here, much higher than that of the mortar and getting close to that of the cannon. So why would you even take the other two into battle? Well, there's a massive difference between the cannons, mortars, and culverins. Cannons and mortars will do explosion and splash damage while the culverins will actually stick to piercing damage. You can see here that the differences in the rarities between the well-made and the optimal have a pretty steep difference in damage, but they can also pierce more enemies the higher you go in quality. And these are very accurate, very long range types of, of equipment that are really honestly meant for popping a hero or blasting through siege towers. Now, like I said earlier, ballistas are very high precision damage, single target types of artillery. Very fun to use, but incredibly inefficient in endgame scenarios where you need to have more strategy involved with not only pressuring heroes, but units as well. Now, moving on to the grape shot, we see some fun things here. Much like the majority of the other artillery on this spreadsheet here, the higher you go in rarity with the grape shot, the more damage it's gonna yield. You have higher armor penetration, you have more shots per round, you have more damage per shot, and more ammo overall. Just think of a tight shotgun package for the optimal or a wider spread birdshot type of package with the grape shot. Moving down to the Scorpio, we see some interesting things here. I mean, yeah, you've got the arcing trajectory like you have with the mortar, but your damage is so, so pitiful here. You have 800 explosion damage, a fraction of what you would find with the mortar, and 300 ticks of damage per three seconds of fire, or four seconds on the optimal version. It, it It's really just, I wouldn't even use it. I have it on this list just so that you can see how terrible it is compared to the other artillery. Jumping down to the special artillery here, the non-craftable ones that you can see in the flaming comets and further down, Flaming Comet really does act similar to the Hawacha, but you'll notice one key thing. While it effectively deals less damage per arrow than what you would find on the Hawacha and fires fewer arrows per shot, there's explosion damage. So explosion in this game is blunt damage. And from my understanding, siege equipment is susceptible to blunt damage. It's why it takes forever for a longbow to fire and take out a piece of siege equipment than if a uh, maul just runs up and gives it a few whaps with a hammer. Jumping up in the rarity from the purple to legendary versions of the Flaming Comet, you'll notice that the only real difference is just damage and a little bit more health. Everything else is effectively the same. So there's really not one way or another that you should use it. If you happen to have it and you want to pop it down to take out some siege towers, it doesn't matter, purple or orange. 
they'll do effectively the same damage. So each ballista is a little bit different as there's a noticeable damage increase from its purple to orange counterpart. And unlike some other pieces of, of siege equipment with pierce damage, there is a limit to how many enemies it can pierce through. It's not really listed in the tooltip for the ballista itself, but for the well-made siege ballista and the optimal or the normal purple siege ballista, it can pierce through an unlimited number of enemies. It just will keep going and it deals very high damage. It will effectively one-shot any hero and any unit, but its main focus is really targeting that siege equipment from a long range, high burst damage, but a long reload time comparatively. Now, we take a look at the war rockets here. War rockets are kind of a hybrid between a mortar and a, a huacha here, where there's multiple shots per, per round, per se, but it does have kind of a sustained area of effect damage here. It's not a single blast burst like you would find with a mortar, and it's not a very super slow fire like you would find with a huacha, but somewhere in between. You get about five rockets per round that cause explosive damage and some burn, as well as like a pretty decently sized splash radius, just a little bit less than that of the purple mortar but roughly the same as what you would find on a blue mortar in terms of splash damage. Now, you'll see a slight difference here between the purple and orange versions of War Rockets here, that you actually, while you have 400 less damage per error, you have a higher splash damage on the purple than you do on the legendary. I honestly have absolutely no idea why they've balanced some of the artillery like this. Um, it, it really doesn't make that much sense to me. I know, you know, you're, you're effectively making them the same when the higher rarities should be a bit more damaging. Maybe not necessarily too much, but it, it really makes these types of siege equipment have effectively no real reason to have a higher rarity. So why not just make them legendary? Anyway, that, my, my little side rant is, is over, and we'll move on to talk about the Catapult here. The Catapult's an interesting one. While the Scorpio is just objectively terrible when it comes to actual usage in most situations, the Catapult is surprisingly not as bad. It's still not the greatest, and there are other more effective siege weapons here that are in this special category of the non-craftable types, but you can do some pretty good damage and put some pretty good pressure on specific areas as there's a, a very wide range to what the actual AoE is. There's no real number for it. It does vary based on, I guess, RNG here because you're firing about 20 stones per shot and you're dealing just under 2,000 damage per stone. Think of, of putting down you know, you've got 20, 20 stones per shot. You're doing about 40,000 points of damage in a given area. If you hit a few of those stones on a piece of artillery, it's gone. If you hit a few of those stones on a person or a group of units, they're effectively gone. I know looking at the numbers here, when I talked about the bombard earlier and it being just elite annihilation of anything in its path, it really is just that. While again, the siege ballista does do the closest amount of damage to a single target that the bombard would do, the bombard itself has a crazy radius on its explosion and its splash damage. Now I haven't quite figured out if the splash damage here is effectively much larger than the explosion or if they kind of share the same here I'm assuming that you have a 15 meter radius for the explosion and then 15 meters outside of that explosion radius is the splash radius and I, since there's no other number on any tooltip for the bombard I feel like it deals effectively 30 meter radius of 45,000 damage I would do more testing but I only have three and I'm really not about to drop one of these down in a non-critical battle just to get some some game footage right now. Again, this is one of your last resort types of things or barely something that you can fire off just for the memes, just for the hell of it. Now for the even more special siege equipment like your tower, trebuchet, and battering ram, there's not a lot of information in game without doing some funky things. I had to dig through some tooltips, patch notes, and whatnot to find that the Siege Tower itself effectively has 115,000 HP. I don't know the actual percentage increase in HP coming from adding the Martellatory units to push it, but you're not really gonna bring your Martellatory to a territory war and take up a, a precious few points of leadership on a throwaway unit just to push a tower. The Siege Towers themselves actually did get a buff during this season, so this is the final 
increased health number. For a trebuchet, it was really hard to find actual health data for it, so I don't necessarily have it here. If I do happen to have it down the road, I will update the spreadsheet, so keep an eye on that. But the other thing that I don't necessarily have is the effective damage coming from a trebuchet. The easiest way to find this out, because there isn't an actual damage number given to the tooltip, nor is there even health number given on the tooltip, please booming and my.com fix that. I would have to tread my shell self, look at the damage, take out the percentage of armor that I am currently wearing on that damage. So there's a lot of extra math and funky things that might not give me the exact accurate number. But just know trebuchets are pretty devastating and a good thing to always throw in, probably not as important as siege towers, but a good thing to throw in with your territory wars. The battering ram, again, same deal here. I couldn't really find much information on the health of it or the effective damage. Most people don't even take this into a territory war, so I, I, I'm just going to completely skip over that. It, it is very useless compared to the other more effective special siege equipment, so I, I wouldn't waste the prestige on it. Now that you have all this information and see the objective numbers, you can see clear distinctions on the best artillery in the game. Naturally, the current meta for artillery is based around what can be easily crafted and in all of my time playing, I haven't seen a drastic change in the meta from season to season. The main artillery to focus on obtaining due to sheer damage numbers and utility are your mortars, both blue and purple for the differences in range, cannons, purple mainly, blue if you don't have them, culverins, and hull watches, both of which the purple versions are the best. Other artillery that can be useful but harder to obtain are things like war rockets, siege ballistas, and flaming comets, as they're pretty much the most effective when it comes to blasting siege from a distance as well as putting pressure on specific areas, especially if you don't have the means to get mortars, cannons, culverins, and hawatches. They're good secondaries. While the other artillery types do have their uses, for just pure unit and hero pressure and the ability to damage enemy artillery, most people are going to stick to using mortars and cannons and culverins for the attacks and defenses of different fiefs within territory wars. Feel free to use whatever artillery you want in normal sieges, but make sure you have those hard-hitting ones and strategic ones for the territory wars, or else some people in your house might not be too happy. Well, that just about wraps up this deep dive on artillery. I hope the information found in this video and spreadsheet were able to help you, but please understand that they are subject to change based on how Booming decides to rebalance artillery from season to season. This entire video could honestly be reworked if we find some new update coming next season that drastically changes a certain artillery type. But that's only happened maybe one or two times before in all the seasons of Conqueror's Blade. If you like this type of video, let me know in the comments and leave a like. To make sure you don't miss out on future guides, please subscribe. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop me a comment on this video, DM me on Twitter, or stop by my Twitch stream. I stream every Monday and Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and mostly every other Sunday at roughly 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>